Hi, everybody. My name is Al Rochelle, and thank you for joining us for this segment. We're going to be talking about pediatric dysregulation, about what that means and how it affects pediatricians. Joining me right now is Dr. Deborah Wiesmeyer. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you, too. Tell me a little bit about your background and what you've been working on in this field. Absolutely. So I'm a physician scientist at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, which is Northwestern University's Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a pediatrician, then a neonatologist, then a controller breathing expert who had the privilege of caring for kids with rare diseases that had autonomic dysregulation at their core, so branched off into developing the emerging discipline of pediatric autonomic medicine. Wow. Now, define dysregulation for me. What does that mean? So dysregulation means different things to different people. Uh -huh. um, the reason it has particular application to the autonomic nervous system is simplistically, the autonomic nervous system is the system that functions automatically right. to sustain life, mm -hmm. affecting virtually all organ systems of the body. So it operates like a fine symphony um, where everything is in perfect regulation. So when you go to sleep, your heart rate and breathing slow. When you exercise, your heart rate and breathing increase. Um, blood pressure changes, temperature regulation, all beautifully regulated. So when that regulation is kicked off balance, we refer to it as dysregulation. Okay, so terms mean everything. So it's autonomic dysregulation. What do you mean by dysregulation? So dysregulation suggests that there is regulation as the norm. So dysregulation would be when, for example, your heart rate variability isn't as um, diverse as it might be, so that your heart rate would change properly when you exercise or when you go to sleep, or dysregulation of your breathing in terms of how big your breaths are or how breath-to-breath -breath variability, temperature regulation. So since the autonomic nervous system it depends upon the automatic variation in all of the systems that function automatically to keep you alive. Yeah, but I was thinking about it, they just normally occur, yeah. Right. So dysregulation, which suggests something is a little off balance, or a lot off balance, but we all take it for granted so much that we, we as individuals, may not even perceive it. But a mm. physician evaluating a child, or a child who has symptoms that they just don't feel good, but when you start to probe deeper, it can, and the reason for this whole experience and interview, is the autonomic nervous system is off balance. Mm -hmm. And by saying not dysfunctional, then you're not putting a label on somebody that a child or a parent might not understand. Now, is it different with pediatrics than it is other age groups? And how does this all fit into the field of pediatrics? Children don't like to be considered dysfunctional. Sure. Um, I don't think anybody likes to be considered dysfunctional. And um, so let's go back to your question mm -hmm. about where does pediatrics fit into all of this. So adults and autonomic dysregulation go back some ways. But for pediatrics to be involved in the movement of autonomic dysregulation is a more new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, in our experience, by having the privilege of taking care of children with rare diseases caused actually by gene mutations in the early embryology of the autonomic nervous system, mm -hmm. we needed objective measures to even quantitate what children were experiencing or the symptoms to make sense of them. Sure. So at the beginning, people thought we were crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and as time went on, since children are not just little big people, yeah. Um, it became clear that there were unique situations in pediatrics that we had to be more attuned to. So we like to say that pediatric autonomic medicine is an emerging discipline. Now, are there forms of that that are, that are more desperate or more, well, that, that could end up being fatal, or that are more difficult uh, to deal with right off the bat? So I think you're coming from the angle that every condition has a name. And sure. in pediatrics, not all conditions have names. Yeah. Um, it, even in adults autonomic medicine, the vast majority of physicians are adult neurologists um, and unfortunately many of the conditions are degenerative. In pediatrics, the autonomic dysregulation is not 
necessarily degenerative, it actually can be congenital. So that children are born with a condition where in the case of congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, right. abbreviated with the acronym CCHS, mm -hmm. those children have a gene mutation that occurs early in the embryology of the autonomic nervous system. So systems that should be in place anatomically as well as functionally might either not be present or may not be functioning as automatically mm -hmm. as they should. So we tend to describe more the dysregulation rather than putting a label. And maybe another good example would be big data, right? It's in the news oh, sure. all yeah. the time. Yeah. So one of our key ambitions um, and many of our research projects are focusing on harnessing big data to identify a child's autonomic signature. So a baby in the neonatal ICU or in the pediatric intensive care unit, we know what healthy looks like but to be able to use the big data to characterize cardiorespiratory coupling, like how we breathe relative to our heart rate, sure. or how our heart rate beats relative to our blood pressure, or temperature regulation. So if we can characterize a child's autonomic signature, mm. then we can look for changes in that to identify is the child's health deteriorating, or is the child responding to intervention, whether it's pharmacologic intervention or any other possible kind of intervention. So how many pediatricians know about this? Because this seems like it's, it's fairly new. It's, it's complicated as all get out. So uh, how many pediatricians out there percentage-wise do you think know about this? 20%, 30%, maybe even less? A lot less, A lot I'm of, sure. Oh, oh, really? So it's, wow. But it's our responsibility to educate people. Yeah. And we are very grateful to have an NHLBI grant looking at preemies born under 29 weeks gestation and in the neonatal ICU and looking at the maturation of the autonomic nervous system relative to control of breathing. So that kind of visibility, and there are five sites who are funded on that project, mm -hmm. that kind of visibility will help people be starting to think more diversely right. instead of thinking, oh, the respiratory rate is X or the heart rate is Y. Right. What's the pattern that that child has had before they became more ill right. um, and as they're beginning to recover so that it has predictive value? Yeah, yeah. So one of my passions mm -hmm. is helping people understand how we can utilize what we know about the autonomic nervous system to better understand health and ill health so that as we learn each child's signature um, we can get a better sense of if our therapies are working for them. And again, with, with and I'll use the word dysautonomia, I know you don't like that word, but, but when you have any kind of thing that involves so many of the systems at once, I mean, you, as a doctor, it must be really frustrating when you go, oh, here's a problem with the breathing, there's a problem with blood pressure, there's a problem with blood work, there's a problem with all, all these other things. You have to look at things holistically, and that's not easy. So that's actually a really interesting point because in the old days, like really old days, yeah. like hundreds of years ago, as medicine was emerging or medicine as we kind of think of it, people used to think holistically. The medical caregivers thought of the whole person. Mm -hmm. Then we got very fancy and sophisticated and then we had pulmonologists and cardiologists and GI experts and neurologists and then everybody got very into their own silo. So our mentality, at least in the program that I I'm in charge of, yeah. is helping people think cross-silo and thinking about how does one system impact another system. Wow. Because to think in silos won't get you anywhere, except yeah. for a very frustrated patient, Absolutely. and in pediatrics, very frustrated parents. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something that's very difficult. Give me a one-liner, and I, I mean that literally, for physicians. What's their one piece of information you could give them that would help them? It's tough to do. I know that. We've been talking about a lot of things here. Just to be alert. There may be other things that, you, that, that are happening out there that you may not know. I think everyone should be advised to think more expansively and creatively about understanding a child's symptoms, that it is not necessarily as simple as we think, and it is not necessarily one acronym is going to solve everything. Wow. And for patients, particularly, and parents, especially with small children, what do you say to them? To be patient with us, the medical community has taken a long time to get to this place, yeah. and but we have to work as a team yeah. so that the families understand that their physicians are doing everything possible to understand their condition. I'll use an example. Yeah. So um, the bracelet that I'm wearing, yeah. actually, it says fight row head. 
ROHAD is the acronym, and yes, we introduced that acronym. Right, right, right. Um, it stands for Rapid Onset Obesity with Hypothalamic Dysfunction, Hypoventilation, okay. and Autonomic Dysregulation. These are very special, amazing children. Yeah. Um, the condition was first described in 1965 right, right. under a very different name, mm -hmm. something like later onset central hypoventilation right, with right. hypothalamic dysfunction. But over the years, as we met our first patient in 2002, who inspired us, mm -hmm. we realized this was a condition that came from very disparate symptoms sure. and made an acronym at our dinner table yeah, um, that would help pediatricians be alerted as soon as they saw that rapid onset weight gain of 20 or 30 pounds over a three to six month period to be alert to the other features mm -hmm. and have spent a tremendous amount of time working with a family who's been very dedicated, sure, sure. starting a foundation um, to educate people that every child who's overweight isn't just overweight because they ate too much. Right, yeah, there might be other right. associated conditions. Wow, well this is all very helpful and I want to congratulate you on all of your hard work and as they say in the medical community, keep it up, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for your time. A pleasure.